welcome to the Capitola City Council meeting in accordance with the current Santa Cruz County Health Order and the Governor's Executive Order N2920. This meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting over Zoom or with your phone is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the slides now shown and on the published meeting agenda. Thank you for attending the City Council meeting. Mayor Peterson, back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're gonna start tonight with roll call. Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Here. Council Member Bator. Here. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now if you could join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Right, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on to, uh, now to presentation. We have an introduction of Santa Cruz County District Attorney Office Neighborhood Courts Program. And to get us started with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chief McManus for an introduction. Thank you, and good evening, Mayor Peterson and Council members. Uh, I'm really excited tonight to introduce our presenter. Uh, Elaine Johnson is with the Santa Cruz County District Attorney's Office, and she's a program coordinator for the Neighborhood Courts uh, Program here in Santa Cruz. She's the lead person that uh, Elaine has uh, uh, introduced and is in the process of implementing this new program here uh, throughout the entire county. And so we're, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more from her and I um, appreciate her and enjoy her presentation. On a personal note, uh, the Neighborhood Courts Program uh, that you're going to hear about and learn about is um, it, it's an innovative program. And it's one of those programs in many years in law enforcement. The best programs and most successful are those that are community driven, uh, innovative, and focus on what we know now as restorative justice principles, which are so valuable for all of us. Most of you know that we've had a juvenile version program here in the city of Capitola, very effective for many, many years. Uh, it operates internally here in the police department with some, some community nexus, but it's a, it's a police department program that's very effective. And I think law enforcement has always been trying to bridge the gap between uh, juvenile diversion programs and similar uh, and, and ideally more effective uh, adult diversion programs. That's what you're going to hear about tonight. So I'm really excited to hear from Elaine. I uh, think you're going to enjoy the presentation. And so I'd like to introduce Elaine Johnson from the Santa Cruz County District Attorney's Office. Elaine, welcome. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for allowing me to be here this evening. Um, it's good to see some friendly faces. Um, so I'm going to share my screen as we walk through the presentation. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, good. So, so, so before I jump in, so when someone gets arrested throughout Santa Cruz County, how the process works is, you know, so the police also arrest somebody, um, they file a report, that report goes to the DA's office, and then the DA's office decides um, if they're going to file charges and what those charges are going to be. And this is where I'm going to lead us into the neighborhood courts program. So he said, so what is neighborhood courts? It's an alternative to the criminal justice system. It's a pre-filing diversion program that is community-based and volunteer-driven. So this means the community that is affected by the crime will be a community that has a voice to help restore crime with the participants. And we'll get more to that later. We use restorative justice principles instead of punitive principles. The conferences are confidential. Participation on behalf of the participant and the, the victim is all voluntary. And it addresses the needs of the offender, the victim, and the community. So as I mentioned, we use restorative justice principles. So in the traditional setting, you may hear language such as what law is broken, who's broken, and what punishment does that person deserve. 
But with them, of course, we're going to use the restorative justice model where we look at what harm was done, what are the needs of those involved who are harmed, and how can we repair that harm with, with restorative principles. So how the program works? Eligible cases get converted from our office, the DA's office, into the neighborhood courts program. The participant who is able to go to neighborhood courts must take full responsibility for the harm they have caused. We use a restorative justice conference, which consists of community volunteer panelists, the participant, who we call the offender, the victim, if there's a direct victim involved, and there is no courtroom, there's no judge, no jury, no attorney. This is all community driven. So how did it work? So during this conference, you have the volunteer panelists and the participant, and they will address three to four things. One, they're going to talk about the harm that was caused to the victim and the community. You know, then it'll take some time to dive deep into the root of what was going on in the participant's life when they committed that crime. But then together, and this is something you don't see in a traditional courtroom, between the participant and the community members, they will work on agreements that the, the, the participant will have to complete in order for them to not have a record. So to complete the program, the participant must fulfill all of the directives that they have agreed upon at the conference. Once those, those directives are completed, our office will not file any charges and the person will not have a record. Now if there are any additional services that the participant may need, we will make sure that they get those services. And if a participant decides not to complete the program or go through the program, his, the case will be rerouted back to the district attorney's office for possible filing. You know, as we launch this program, right now we're going to start with low-level misdemeanor offenses, and we're going to start out with these 12 eligible cases. So we're looking at, you know, like petty theft and shoplifting, bad orders and trespassing, disorderly conduct in front of the public, misdemeanor assault and battery, you know, drug possession, drug paraphernalia, receive a stolen property and burglary doing and such. Because we want to start this program off slow, you know, because we want to make sure in order for us to be successful, we don't want to jump right into, you know, felonies and those kind of cases. We're going to start with low level misdemeanor cases. Um, these are the twelve that the cases that we're going to choose from. Now to be eligible for the for, for the program, the participant must be 18 and over. This is their first time offense. They must take full responsibility for the, their actions, and if the victim is requesting restitution, they must pay the restitution. Now, the volunteer panelists consist, consist of people such as yourself. As I mentioned, this is all community driven, so it's run by community members who participate in a two day training. We ask for your commitment of two years. And what that two years means is it doesn't mean that you're going to attend every single conference for the next two years. But what it is is so we can have a pool of diverse volunteers that we can pull from. We want to be able to have your name on the list for at least two years. And of course, you will participate in neighborhood court conferences. And as I mentioned earlier, the victim participation, they have the choice of participating or not participating. Um, they can they can write a letter and have one of our victims advocate support at the office come to the conference and read it to them, or they can come to the conference with the victims advocate support. If they get to choose them. And here's just a small look at some of our directives that we may offer to the participants and allow them to restore the harm um, and trust back into the community. Um, so they may we may suggest they can AA meeting, write an apology letter, whether that's to a store manager, their family, their boss. Um, during the conference, you know, they'll discuss what was going on in the participant's life, and the, one of the questions that they ask is who they, they felt they have harmed. And those people that the participant may list, we may suggest that they write an apology letter for them. You know, we may have them write a reflective paper, and or one of the things, you know, now that we're in COVID land, um, a lot of the directors of DS the stuff that's going to be online because a lot of the, the different things in the local community is not open right now. Um, so we may have them um, take a look at a four-hour class that has to do with um, theft 
you know, that the person who has stolen something from, say, a store, that they understand the impact and the ripple effect of their actions. You know, we may suggest they take some an anger management or stress management classes and those sorts of things. So now the goals of the conference is one, it's going to be community driven. Again, the community that was harmed by the act is the community that we want to have to give a voice to help with the reform of the, the harm. It'll reduce the burden on the criminal courts. Right now, the courts are really overburdened with a lot of misdemeanor offenses. It'll save a lot of time and money. And it'll reduce reoffending. And this is a big part of the program. Um, it's for the participant not to reoffend again. And of course, it'll build trust back into the community. So here's some results from San Francisco. It's well, the county that we're modeling um, neighborhood courts from. They're the, they're, they're the first county to kick off neighborhood courts. And in all the last eight years, in the 3,600 cases they had, they've had a 91% success rate, which is pretty impressive. You know, same with Yolo County. Um, they're over 2,000 cases now, and um, their success rate is about 94%. And Yolo County got the place right now where they have neighborhood courts, you know, for low level offenses, and they have neighborhood courts for the homeless. They have neighborhood courts for um, substance use. I mean, they're on like level four. Yeah, and we look forward to it finally when we get there. But right now, we're going to start with the low level misdemeanor offenses. And ways we invite the community to get involved because this is all community driven. We are currently recruiting volunteers um, and volunteer panelists. Um, so I have information that I'd be happy to. Um, send to the chief, you know, if you want to post a flyer on the website or, or whatever you feel comfortable doing. But, um, but we really want the community to get involved because this is a community involved program. Let me just say the vendors and the stores, they can, everybody gets this there. And I'd like to open up if anybody has any questions. Presentation. Uh, I the program sounds wonderful. My question is, given the size of Capitola, how many uh, participants do you think we would need to get from our community to create this pool? Um, it, 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 it doesn't really matter. I mean, we just we just collect an all sorts of volunteers. It just it, it's from throughout County. Right. Well, well, if you volunteers for this, would you be working just in Capitola, or would you actually be working in Santa Cruz County? Well, we're going to be throughout the county. Right now, we're, going to, we're starting out in the Live Oak area, but as we grow, we'll, we'll grow like Scott Valley, downtown, um, Capitola location, probably SoCal, and two in South County. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right now with COVID, it, it, we're kind of limited. Okay, but that's all right. I, I, I need volunteers to make this work, but... Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, if yeah, you know anybody that's interested, including yourself, you can go right on to the DA's website and for the name of course, and you can fill out the application and just click email and it'll come right to you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. I see we also have questions uh, first from Councilmember Breton and then to Councilmember Story. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Johnson, for giving us this presentation. <laughs> That's like a very innovative program. Uh, I guess my question is, if somebody were interested in being a panelist, mm -hmm. um, what kind of skills or background or experience uh, do they, uh, should they have or should they feel that they have in order for them to be a success in the program? Um, and uh, what kind of uh, training will uh, the DA's office provide for the panelists? Um, so the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz has been hired to do the training. And if you go on our website, you'll see the schedule. The schedule right now is, you know, due to COVID, we have to do it um, via Zoom. But it's like November 11th and 12th, 5.30 to 8.30. And then the following week, um, 5.30 to 8.30. And we're looking at doing a four-hour mock run-through in person. Um, but we're still looking at that. And if that goes through, it'll be in the county building. 
downstairs in the cafeteria where they, they take out they they the cafeteria don't look like a cafeteria anymore. They use it more like actually the board of supervisors use that for their meetings, um, so we can have social distance space. And as far as qualifications, we 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 lived in Santa Cruz County for at least three years. You don't have to have any mediation skills and stuff like that. It's it's everyone who lives in this county has been affected by some sort of harm, whether it's their neighbor, their friend, their family, whatever. And so it's more about coming with an open mind, but it's about coming with wanting, wanting the harm to be restored, you know, to the victim, to yourself as well, to be part of the community, and to the participants. So that's why I invite everyone to please sign up. You don't have to have any special, special skills. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Sam asked one of the questions. Asking. My second question is, is probably kind of a little squirrely, but uh, I'm often confused about um, when uh, children under 18 are tried as adults. And, you know, I have to admit, you know, I just don't know all the criteria. You know, I'm not involved in law enforcement. But what happens in a case like that? Um, if we have neighbor reports or something like that, if a child less than 18 was being tried, it could potentially try as an adult because of the offense. These are low level offenses, so it's for adults, it's adults only. So if, if, a, if a child has committed an offense that, if it's low level misdemeanor, it won't go through this program. Okay, and so when assaults are, are low enough, I mean, assault can be quite um, well, mad at that point. Yep. Well, but I'm glad you brought that up because when we say there's assault, and as, as when I say misdemeanor assault, they're very different. Okay. And that's what, yes, the, you know, misdemeanor assault, and this can come up a lot with these days, could be something as someone throws an empty plastic cup at you and they miss. That's a misdemeanor assault. It's, it's, it's not where somebody's getting beat up and that kind of stuff. That's a felony, and that's not something that we're, we're not doing felonies. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. You're welcome. Mayor Pearson, I want to thank you for adding a little bit just to yes, remember for Trans question as it relates to juveniles who are uh, sometimes uh, prosecuted as adults. They look at uh, criminal history often. They look at the severity of the crime often. And they always look at the criminal sophistication on the part of the suspect that determines often whether or not that juvenile can be tried as an adult. None of those will fit into the court's um, protocol. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Elaine. So I'm just going to check the dinner. Is there anybody else any questions? Yeah, I, I believe uh, Vice Mayor Burke has a question. Yeah. Hi, Elaine. Thank you so much. This is a program that sounds exceptional, mm -hmm. and what a great idea to bring to the county. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about partnership with Capitola and what that So when you say partnership, are you talking about um, the police chief, all the police chiefs buying in on the program in general? Because that, that's the first thing that happens. Yeah. Okay. That all, that all, of the, all of the police chiefs throughout the county is, is partnered partner with us, uh, and also on the judicial office is partnered with us to make sure that for this program to happen. They, they have, we have their full support. Great. And then the second part of that is, so then what happens? Somebody is arrested and we find out that somebody from Capitola and mm -hmm. the other members are from all over the county and we all come together um, to discuss what, how does that work? If you don't mind elaborating a little bit about this. So if, if somebody in Capitola gets arrested, the same as they get arrested in Santa Cruz, Star Valley, the case goes to the DA's office, right? Every case goes to the DA's office, they look at the case, we say, okay, this is eligible for neighborhood court. And then we set up a conference, and then I get three people, community members, to sit by the conference. Now, if somebody just happens to be from Capitola, great, but that, that's not necessarily a qualification. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes. Oh, very welcome. Good to see you.
do with this? And I think Council Member Bertrand might have one more question. Yeah, yeah I do. Um, Sheriff Hart, when President Obama was in office, participated in a conference dealing with um, coming up with points about community policing, and interesting report came out of that. And then he brought back to uh, Santa Cruz um, that report and then carved out from that total report what makes sense in Santa Cruz. And, and I went to some of those meetings where they talked about that. Um, is this considered an addendum to a community policing um, focus? Or is it something separate? It's something very separate. Okay, okay thank you. Something very separate. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right, any additional questions from council? And I'm seeing none. So thank you so much, Elaine. We really appreciate you being here and sharing this uh, with us. I really appreciate it. As, uh, I'm sure the rest of the council does as well. Thank you so very much, everybody. You have a good night. You too. Take care. Thanks so much. All right, we're going to move on now to item three on tonight's agenda. Uh, are there any additional materials for tonight's meeting? Yes, there was one community comment regarding item 8A and one staff provided report for item 8B that was sent to council. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? No changes tonight's agenda. Okay. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to item five, which is public comment. Uh, now is the time for any member of the public to address the council on items that are not on the agenda for tonight's meeting. And I'll turn it over to uh, Larry, our moderator, to let us know if you've received any written or uh, have anyone in person that would like to give public comment. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, I do not see anyone uh, in the meeting with their hands up asking to comment. And I do not see any emails on public comment. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll close public comment, bring it back for city council and staff comments. Are there any uh, staff members that have comments this evening? Yes. Uh, Mayor Peterson, this is Katie Doherty, community law contractor and city and council. Um, the city, I want to give you an update on the, the outdoor COVID-19 temporary uses. We're moving forward with um, guidance documents tomorrow, which will be released to all the businesses on how to keep their spaces as well as cover their spaces. So we've been working closely, I've been working closely with Steve Jeffers, our public works director, and Robin Woodman, our building official, and also Sam Butler, the city attorney, as well as the fire department. So we now have a coordinated um, document and it'll be released tomorrow and I know um, thank all the uh, businesses for their patience while we get something together that hopefully will be a quick approval for all those that comply with the standards in there. So that'll be released tomorrow. Fantastic. Thank you Katie. I know that um, uh, you're uh, working part of the BIA meeting uh, earlier this week and, and I know that uh, quite a few of our businesses are, are really looking forward to receiving that guidance. So thank you so much for all the work that, uh, that you've all put into that. Welcome. All right, any additional staff comments? Yes, Mary, this is Steve Jesper, Public Works Director. Uh, I just wanted to let the council know that before the next council meeting on November 2nd, the uh, contractor will begin work on the jetty project. This is where they'll be stacking rock along the jetty. Uh, unfortunately, we're unable to begin work on the flume project at the same time because we haven't had any rain to open the creek. So that part will have to wait until later in the winter after we get some rain. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's exciting. We've been talking about that for a couple of years now. And I was just telling someone the other day that when I was a kid, you couldn't see the wall that runs between the rocks uh, at the jetty. And now you can. So I'm excited to see that uh, built back up. Um, any additional staff comments? Seeing none, we'll turn it over to Council. I see that Vice Mayor Brooks has a hand up. Yeah, thank you so much, Mayor Peterson. I just wanted to share um, about an upcoming event and collaboration with the um, County Park Friends, the Chattery, and the United Way, and it's the NAACP um, in Health Matters. The Community Wellness Initiative um, to bring safe members of Santa Cruz County. And this Saturday, 
Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Any additional comments from council members? Seeing none. Oh, the city council member for John. <laughs> um, I believe I read something about our participation in the Halloween party with the owners of the mall. I was wondering if staff could uh, detail that. Are there any staff that can speak? Are you referring to the, the, the drive through trick or treat event that the mall is having, Sean? No. The farm parade? No. Okay. Is there any staff that can speak to uh, whether or not the city uh, is, is actively participating in, in that? Again, unfortunately, Nikki isn't uh, able to join us this evening. I think a lot of meeting we had a question and I think it's got her meetings wrong, but she is not with us this evening. The city is sponsoring in partnership with the mall and the Chamber of Commerce a um, Halloween cruise, I think is what we're calling it, that begins at the Capitol Mall and then we'll roll through town and we'll conclude at the community center. And it looks like our uh, moderator has put up the flyer for it, which is going to take place at 2 p.m. on October 31st. Everyone is welcome. Uh, the idea is to dress up your car, and everyone can be a safe distance and still enjoy Halloween. And if you make it to the community center, we uh, will have some treats for you as well. Great, thank you. Any additional uh, comments from council? All right, seeing none, uh, we will move on now to the consent calendar. All the items listed on the consent calendar will be enacted by one motion in the form listed on the agenda, and there will be no separate discussion on these items uh, prior to our vote unless a member of the city council requests that specific items be discussed for a separate review. Items pulled for separate discussion will be considered uh, following our general government item. So is there any member of the city council that would like to um, remove an item? I see two hands up. Uh, council member story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, on item uh, D, um, I didn't necessarily want to remove it, but I understood from the city manager that there's an update uh, to our tier status that uh, may be coming up next Tuesday. And I was wondering if we could get a short report about that update and whether we're still on the track. Uh, for um, uh, uh, lowering of our tier color. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, <clears throat> for those of you who are following along at home, the state of California has a, a four tier system to rank for what uh, the allowed activities are in every single county in the state. Um, currently, we are in the second, we are sort of the second highest tier. And every Tuesday, the state reviews your data to determine whether the, whether the counties will change tiers. This week, we qualified to move down a tier to the second lowest tier. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we're currently in red, and we'll be moved down to orange, which would allow more activities, uh, offices to open, as well as increased activities in retail establishments, as well as um, dining establishments. The rules, as I understand it, are that we need to be at that lower tier for several weeks. I think previously I suggested it was one week and then we would move into the orange tier. I'm hearing for a follow-up it's probably two weeks. So I think at this stage, as long as our numbers stay good, uh, uh, the expectation would be that we would move into the orange tier coming up in about 12 days from now. Yeah. Thank you for that update, Jamie. Appreciate it. Yes, I just had a question of the staff. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, updated uh, power supply for the city hall complex, um, where would that be? And, and I think we have one right now outside the uh, police department. Uh, what's the uh, proposal there? Mayor, I can respond to that. That's fine. Yes, please, thank you. So we should currently do have a generator for the hall that only um, power to the police station and then the computer um, server. So if there's not power upstairs to the offices uh, or the council chamber community room. So we are looking at uh, finding a bigger um, power source that will power the entire city hall complex. Uh, the grant is based towards a, a greener uh, solution than a diesel power generator. So we're currently looking at a battery power wall and solar panels to charge it. So um, 
getting the pricing for that um, and making sure that we qualify for the grant. Thank you. All right. Uh, if there's no additional uh, questions from the council or comments on our consent uh, calendar, then we will entertain a motion. I move the consent calendar. I'm sorry, what was that? Madam Mayor, would you like to go to the public first? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rothkorff. I appreciate that. Yes, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, go to the public for public comment on our consent uh, calendar. I'll turn it over to our moderator. Mayor Peterson, I do not see anyone in attendance with their hand raised to talk, and I do not see any emails on the consent calendar. All right. Thank you very much. With that, we will close public comment on our consent uh, calendar and bring it back to uh, to council. I made the motion to move it earlier. Yeah. I think there was second. I'll second that motion. Okay. okay. Uh, motion by Councilmember Bertrand, seconded by Councilmember Story. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. I for. Councilmember Botswerf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Passes unanimously. We're going to move on now to our general general government items. We'll start with item 8A, first reading of chapter 17, zoning code and local coastal plan adoption. And I'll turn it over to staff. Mayor and Council. Uh, before you this evening, we have the zoning code update and for adoption. Um, just as a reminder, um, we adopted the first zoning code update in 2018. The goal during that time was to adopt a zoning code that reflected the general plan, which was adopted in 2014, make it user friendly, um, add clear and concise plain English, less for the general public, um, adding tables and diagrams for them to follow, um, to promote quality design. I think one of the main um, drivers is to preserve place, a special place we call Capitola, and protect the environment, our historic preservation, also supporting economic development, and simplifying the language to uh, clarify the procedures within zoning codes, which are often confusing to follow. So that was, we achieved that in 2018, um, submitted our zoning code informally to the Coastal Commission, received comments back, and for the past two and a half years, we've been working on the update focused on the Coastal Commission's comments that we had back. In total, there were 25 meetings for the 2018 update to the zoning code, and tonight we're on our 11th meeting for um, the update to the Coastal Commission responses. So uh, it's been a long journey, but we're here tonight to officially move forward with the first reading. Um, so as I just explained the process, we are currently at the final draft and published for the adoption hearing. And this evening I'll be asking for a first reading of the ordinance. I'm not going to go through all the updates that have taken place, I think, during the, uh, the meetings over since past summer and all the bigger items we've touched upon. If there's questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer those. Um, but I'm just going to walk through the process for the uh, LCP adoption. Um, so once the first reading, the first and second readings are in our zoning code is adopted, we'll submit the LCP to the Coastal Commission for adoption. We'll schedule it for a hearing. Um, best case scenario is it gets approved and certified. Um, the other scenarios is that they redline the document and Capitola accepts those redlines and it is therefore certified. We could not accept their redlines and um, propose revisions in which we go back through the process. And lastly, I think, um, if we don't agree with the redlines and decide not to adopt, then we'll have two codes in place and the submittal lapses. Um, our recommendation this evening is to the first reading and waive the reading of the text of the proposed ordinance amending Title 17. 
and to adopt the proposed resolution authorizing staff to submit the zoning code update, LCP update, to the Coastal Commission for certification. So with that, um, I'm available for questions. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. My, my question goes to the process of the Coastal Commission and the course, and that they should redline, and then it goes back and forth, and that could you know, take many months, if not years. During that period, um, I assume that our old zoning code would be enforced and applied in the coastal zone. Um, but there are certain areas like, for example, the Capitola Hotel Theater site. Um, would the general plan um, specification um, apply to that site during that, uh, during that period? Um, so I'm just trying to understand where we are to get into this back and forth with the Coastal Commission for an extended period of time. Um, so the general plan gives a broader overview for future development and uh, lays out the broader plan and the zoning code is very specific about what can happen in each of the zones. However, the general plan also, in our general plan, um, it also specifies, you know, the maximum floor area ratio. So in the, for the specific question about um, the possibility of future development, a lot of the, um, the general plan has put into place the incentive program for saying if, if someone were to provide community benefits, they could get a greater FAR, which there is no FAR requirement in our existing zoning code that has, you know, our previously certified zoning code. So if the hotel was to come in within the interim, they could apply for that larger FAR because it is identified within the general plan. However, in the zoning code update, um, we solidify that more by having the FAR within the zoning code update. But, um, but in general, for any projects that come in within the coastal zone, they'll be subject to the zoning code, that is the previous zoning code, um, that prior to 2018 adoption, and until the time it is certified by the Coastal Commission, that previous zoning code will be in place. Thank you, Jill. It's um, a very succinct answer. I think uh, Dr. Hurley's answer was certainly in depth, but I think the, the simplest way to think about it is for parks properties that are in the coastal zone, until the new code is certified, you have to comply with both the general plan and the old zoning. So it's really the most restrictive of the two. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. I believe uh, council member for Tom just has his hand up and he lowered it. Was there a question answered? Or? You're muted, council member for Tom. No, my, my finger sort of pushed the button accidentally, sorry. So I have a question about uh, severability. I learned about that term in the um, hearings recently for the Supreme Court. And so my question is, can a um, item in the code be severed for future discussion and vote on the rest of the code and pass that on? This may be a question for um, our city lawyer, but. Um, um, so in theory, it really strikes me, it's not quite a severability issue. It would just be that the council decides to um, continue the item for further discussion on a particular issue within the code. Can you tell me what you're thinking about? But is it a well, uh, yeah, I'm concerned about the um, hotel site, proposed hotel site, or the theater vis-a-vis. -vis. Um, I would like to see if we could sever that, uh, move on everything else to the Coastal Commission, and 
continue the discussion on that. Thank you. So perhaps before we decide if uh, the mayor should step out, perhaps some other council members can provide some feedback about whether you would like to have an additional conversation about the protocol portion of the code. That might make the most sense. Mayor Peterson, I, I don't mean to cut you off. No, I just wanted to, to just for um, clarification on procedure. Should we continue with questions and go to public comment and then come back for the discussion of if any of that needs to be pulled or should we do that now? That's fine too. Sure. Okay, let's do that. So uh, we heard your, your uh, concerns, Josh. We'll go to, uh, we'll finish with questions, go to public comment, and then when we come back, if you want to continue that discussion, I'll recuse and we'll move forward from there. All right. Uh, I thought I saw uh, Council Member Boss wrote his hand up. Did you have a question? Uh, Mayor, I, I was going to make a comment, but I believe your action is appropriate to go to the public first and come back and discuss it. And at that point, I'll have a comment. Okay, great. Uh, seeing no further questions from Council, we will bring this item to public comment. I'll turn it over uh, again to our moderator to determine if we have any public comment. Mayor Peterson, I have we have one person uh, attendee wishing to talk, um, so I will uh, allow. MMM to talk at this point. All right, I can, I can see you've got my screen name. I apologize for that. This is uh, Michael Morrissey. Uh, my wife and I um, have uh, a residence of Capitola, and we have property on the bluff at, uh, off of Sacramento. Um, as you might recall, uh, I have uh, spoken uh, to the council previously uh, on this topic, and I wanted to take a few minutes tonight to uh, to share some thoughts um, on the uh, on the entire process on you know, on on the um, the I guess resolution that's up for the vote tonight. First of all, I want to uh, thank the council, and I want to thank uh, Katie and her team for doing just a fantastic job in pulling this together. Um, this has been a uh, an Herculean effort that covers. Uh, obviously, every component uh, of, the, of the city uh, and, and many, uh, many stakeholders uh, across uh, various uh, important constituents. And I think the city and, uh, and staff are to be commended for making this process very open, very transparent, and very inclusive. And I think that's uh, you know, a real testament to your commitment to that kind of dialogue which makes Capitola such a vibrant community. So, um, so first of all, I wanted to thank you for that. We, we are relatively new. We've been uh, residents now for three years, and uh, obviously very, uh, this is a very important topic to us, but uh, we're very pleased with the process um, as it's evolved. Um, I've, I've gone through the red line several times. As you know, we've had um, our attorney look at it carefully. Uh, we've provided comments. Um, you know, we're, um, we're happy with the document as uh, and the red line as currently outlined um, in the agenda, uh, in the attachment. Um, it's uh, true to the Coastal Act. Um, property owners like us don't really benefit greatly, uh, but we don't lose a lot either in terms of the, uh, I think, the principles and the guidelines that are uh, part of state law as, uh, as written in the Coastal Act. So, so we're very pleased with that, um, and we're very happy to have this go forward now back to Coastal. I think obviously the next big step is 
uh, is, is how Coastal responds to the red lines uh, that uh, are, are attached uh, in this document. And, uh, and I think the challenging times will come in the future uh, when, if and when Coastal pushes back on various initiatives that they would like to see uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of the next wave of their guidance uh, be, becoming uh, law in different cities uh, that are not really reflected in the actual Coastal Act. So, so we'll have more challenges going forward. And uh, I know I speak for everybody else uh, who is directly impacted uh, by, uh, by this uh, document that we will be looking forward to working with staff and city council uh, as those comments come in uh, to be able to help uh, everyone navigate those as we go forward. But again, thank you uh, for all the efforts. We're really uh, excited to be part of this community and looking forward to working with everybody uh, on this topic as we go forward. Great, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Larry, any additional public comments this evening? I do not see anyone else uh, in attendance with their hands raised, and I do not see any emails on this item. Okay, with that, we'll uh, close public comment on this item. We'll bring it back to council. Um, I see Council Member Bosworth and Vice Mayor Brooks uh, have their hands up. So let's start uh, with Councilmember Bosworth, and we'll go to Vice Mayor Brooks, and then we'll return to you, Councilmember Bertrand, uh, to determine how you'd like to move forward with your uh, questions that you asked earlier. Oh, great, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, have, I have a couple of comments I want to make about um, the, the plan, but I think right now we're before us is uh, Councilmember Bertrand has talked about the issue about um, reopening one item on this document because I think some of the other comments I was going to make was more general about the, the entire social plan. But seems that we have to deal with this item right now. I, I just want to make a position that I believe the last meeting when we discussed this, Council Member Bertrand brought up this item about redoing uh, the, the, um, the perceived height of the hotel. And we took a vote on it at that point and we voted against it. And I think it was clear that the council was in favor of moving, moving forward. So I don't see the point of redoing that vote again when we already decided uh, that, that we were we were okay with what was has been discussed which has been discussed uh, at nauseum so uh, I, I'm not willing to reopen that one topic. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bosworth. Vice Mayor Brooks. I will second that for future discussion. All right, we have a motion uh, by Vice Mayor Brooks and a second by Council Member Bosworth, and uh, discussion will continue. I see uh, Council Member Bertrand has his hand raised. Right. Um, first of all, I'd like to comment and withdraw due to sincerity and respect that uh, Katie and her staff have done a wonderful job. And this is, I think, something everyone on the council recognizes and as we heard people in the community recognize and in general i think everyone city staff recognizes this is not an easy job and it was made easier by katie establishing a good relationship with the coastal commission staff and then the detail that oh sorry someone was talking sorry so you know and, Sorry, just for a second, uh, Council Member Bertrand, if we could uh, have our moderator mute everyone, uh, and then we'll have Council Member Bertrand unmute himself. All right, go ahead. All right, you all have to unmute. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, so, thanks. Thank you. So, um, 
know, the detail that was put into this, and, you know, as you best said, you know, we needed to understand this process, and the step-by-step -step portions that we took item by item, red line by red line, is, is a great effort, I have to admit. And yes, in the last couple of weeks, I brought up the issue of the hotel, and when I read this, and the reason why I've been bringing it up, and, you know, and I will continue to bring it up as long as I can, is because we've heard the public. We've heard the public. I've gone to city council meetings. I've gone to uh, city planning meetings. I've read the letters. And we've heard the public. And in general, there's a multitude of considerations that they have that this code does not reflect. There's height issues. There's bulk issues. And there's the impact on the city for traffic to this one of them. And to be able to say with this reading that we're just going to allow some sort of mitigating factors to cover these things, going from far two to far three, there's your height and bulk issues. It's not good enough for me. It doesn't specify what we need to protect the concerns of the residents of Capitola, they've been very clear about what their concerns are. When I was mayor last year, you know, I'm listening to these concerns, and I would make a habit of going downtown and talking to the residents, and all too often they said, we like the charm of this village, we like the quaint features, we don't like the fact that I mean, excuse me, we don't go to other places <laughs> that have these big, huge entertainment places and hotels and stuff like that. They come here for a small hometown, old beach town place. That's why they come here. So that's why when we have all these terms on what's going to happen or what might not happen, but we propose, we get so much pushback. So I'd like to remind people about the situation we're in right now, because it happened years ago with the press department. That was meant to be a city park. And look what it is now. City council at some point has said, oh, we need the money. We're just going to make this decision, and we'll get some apartments up there, and we need the money. We made other decisions like, like that. Department, excuse me, the property that the library is on, that was a similar thing. That was a huge piece of property. We sold it off for whatever need it was at that time. And no one can remember what the needs were. I can. It was before my time. The one up in, on Depot Hill, the press, where the press is right now, I don't think anyone can remember why we need the money so badly. So I was reading over all the comments, and I wrote I have about five, six pages or more here. I didn't count actually. The ones that settled the for me is people said over and over again, "Don't give up the soul of our city." So this is a decision we're making right now, and years from now, people will say, "Why do we do this hotel?" It stands out, stands out like a sore thumb. It causes so many different problems. We sold out. So I really do think that we should set aside this item and have a real in-depth discussion on it. What's being proposed does not reflect what we heard. We're city council people. We're the ones that are, are responsible to make that policy decision we never really did make that. We're just accepting, we're not discussing what's presented to us. Councilmember Bertrand, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, because you're um, discussing the potential for having a separate conversation on the hotel, I'm going to go ahead and step out and recuse myself at this point. I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, Vice Mayor Brooks for any continued discussion uh, that you all may have specifically about um, this hotel item. And then please let me know. Uh, when we're ready to go back to the general discussion of the overall zoning code, please let me know and I'll, I'll return. But for now, I'm going to turn the uh, 
uh, leading over to Vice Mayor Burke uh, for you all to continue this conversation. That was essentially what I wanted to say. And the other thing that I think is important to consider is when I talked around to people who are normally involved, it was not readily known that this was going to be the vote tonight. When COVID goes away and people start caring about what's going on in the city to the extent that they used to, they would read the agenda, you know, send a letter, think about it. We're voting on Country March 5th tonight. If it was normally attended to, what <laughs> the people were, were normally aware of, we'd get many more responses, but we'd be in a, in a crowded meeting room. It's perfect. So we're taking an action that's going to have a huge impact on Capitola. And all we have here is a form, basically. So I think we're moving ahead too rapidly. It is true that Katie has put together a wonderful effort. And, you know, under normal circumstances, you would be deceived by your constituents. There would be letters to the city council. There would be back, back meetings with residents and stuff like that. It would be a huge issue. That's the next thing I was going to get to. But I'd like to hear other comments first, because I am going to be too scared to make a motion. Um, I see Councilmember Story's hand raised. Councilmember Story? Well, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I guess I wanted to respond to Jacques' concerns um, and just let everybody out in the public know that there is no hotel project before us tonight. Um, we are voting on a zoning framework to be able to um, judge and assess any project that may come forward in the future. Um, and I also want to point out that for the most part, um, the concerns about the um, floor area ratio have already taken place and they're in our general plan. And the general plan is an enforceable document. Um, you know, when I first came on the council in 2006, and we started working on that general plan, and it was not approved until 2014. And then there were later amendments added to it in 2019. So that's over 10 years of discussion about this planning document and the zoning framework. And within those documents, it states that the floor area ratio for the hotel theater project, which is, I think, the focus of attention right now, is 2.0. And that there are incentives for a developer to make it 3.0. And there's three stated conditions. Now, my concern is that if we don't pass the zoning um, ordinance tonight, we're not going to have the tools in order to be able to best uh, protect uh, the neighborhood, the village, and the greater community of Capitola. Um, that's why I think it's important that we go on and submit the zoning codes um, to the Coastal Commission so we can start that process. Uh, it's because I think that our hands are done, if we don't have this zoning code, which has more of the specifics about the conditions on which a developer could go from two to three, then we're gonna be severely hamstrung uh, during that process. And that's why, so, so to a certain extent, you know, the horse is already out of the barn in terms of the floor or ratio on that property. Um, and this council and future councils need to have the tools to be able to make sure 
show substantial community benefit before it goes beyond, uh, beyond 2.0. Um, and I think with those schools, we can have a, a better project for the community. But just to an ending, um, there is no project here before us. Um, and also, I want to just on another, since I have the microphone, to say that um, uh, as, as to the, the learning code, as, as it may apply to the monarch code, uh, I'm going to repeat myself. I don't think that's going to be the second discussion. The decision will probably be made by the council uh, on that matter. Uh, but to the extent that you know I'm involved in that, I'm going to repeat myself on that aspect of it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you for acknowledging me. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Story for uh, for so eloquently clarifying and uh, enlightening this conversation. There is no project that we're approving tonight. We all know from our experience on this council that it's a long and beautiful process to approve any project. And, and I'm sure that if there ever was to be a discussion on a hotel and village, it would be a long process with a lot of community. Uh, involvement. So I do not feel like I am doing the community any disservice by approving this document. I personally have reservations with this document. I feel like the Coastal Commission is an overbearing group that has been taking control of our city. And I feel like that, that, that our staff have gone to great effort to try to squeeze every little bit of control we can possibly maintain to try to do what's good best for our city and our community. I still don't feel like we accomplished that, but I do acknowledge that this is as good as it gets. So uh, I'm a little reluctant to open up this conversation. I, I do have more comments I want to make, but I, I appreciate uh, Councilman Story's comments. And uh, if there's going to be a motion that's made to open up this topic, I'd rather get that done now, because I'd rather get the mayor back in here so we can have the conversation about the entire Yes, Mayor, my name is Kelly. Um, no, I, I appreciate what Sam said, and to some extent that identifies that it takes care of one aspect, but when I listened to what Swenson staff has said, and I was at the general plan meeting, and I was a member, and I remember the threat that the um, architect was doing that sort of laid out what the Swensons wanted for a hotel. The plan basically hasn't changed at all. It was an architect sort of doing what he had to do at a, at a table there at J Street Park. And so I asked him, well, where are you getting your ideas? You know, are, are you looking at our input? Because <laughs> he had all these table discussions. He says, no, I'm just doing what Swensons want me to do. And that plan generally hasn't changed. There's been modifications here and there and stuff like that, but the main issues of bulk and price has not changed. When they talk about amenities that they're going to provide for the city, we're going to get this um, view area that will be quite nice, and a stairway that leads down to the area in front of the stage that will be quite nice. And this is what they consider an amenity that we're going to get. I am, but what we're really talking about here is a position that the city will have when we go into discussions with whoever that developer's going to be. And I feel it's a fairly weak position in terms of bargaining. And the reason why I mention that platform is because we already know what Swenson is going to propose. They haven't changed since when they did the Surrette at J Street Park. They want, they've actually increased the numbers. So, yes, we don't have a proposal, but we all know, or some of us should know, what it was like dealing with them on the Richmond Mansion. 
They push the city of Capitol Falls, they push it, they push it, they push it, they push it, until someone burns it down. They will not. They will do the same sort of thing with this here. And I'm talking about it from the standpoint we need to protect the city's interest. And I feel that there should be more in that section that gives our city staff latitude in the negotiations with Clinton. And that's the reason why I keep saying that. Good order, kind of point of order. If we're going to have a motion to have this conversation, I think the motion needs to be made for an amendment. Otherwise, I don't understand why we're discussing something we haven't agreed to discuss. You're absolutely right, Dan. We haven't really just had that discussion. So I will make a motion that we pull out the section dealing with the city, um, city's proposed zoning for the future um, hotel at the Sierra Spring. That's my motion. And put that for later and have a public discussion on it when the public can be involved. I'm going to take a look and get that for you right now. Sure, we'll take a pause and give you a moment. Okay, I will accept Sam's uh, version of a perspective of our way of planning. Thank you. Okay, if you just give us just a moment to find the number so that we can have that ready for the record. The incentives for community benefits is Chapter 17.88. Actually, this is the one that's dealing with the um, the proposed hotel on the Cedar side, correct? That's correct. And I think we would also amend parts of the um, village. Let me get that section for you as well. Um, and portions of Chapter 17.20 for the mixed use zoning district to take out the references the later chapter. Right. Okay. I'll set staff recommendation on that. Okay. And so I think the motion would be, um, and perhaps before doing this, I'll ask Director Burleby if it is that easily um, to use council member Bertrand's term severed from the update. Is it possible to remove all references to the hotel that cleanly? I believe we, we could. And there, there'd be sections of chapter 17.88 and sections and just references to that chapter um, within chapter 1720. Can I, can I offer a suggestion here? I think that the thing to do, uh, Councilor Bertrand, I think that the, your intent is simply that you want to spend some more time focused on the hotel thing issue. So let's see if that motion passes, and if it does, then let's try to figure out how we would go about doing that. Point of order, I believe this would be a substitute motion we're doing right now because we already have a motion on the floor. Correct. Thank you. Is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, Councilor Bosco, if your hand is up, is that from a previous discussion or something new? 
No, Mayor, I have some comments on the, uh, on the coastal plan in general until we got off on the sidebar discussion. But I just want to finish my comment because I know you're probably anxious to call the vote. So uh, um, what I wanted to say was uh, I've been working, I too was on the general plan committee. I've been working along with uh, not only Katie, but Richard knows for a lot of time because we have been working on this document for many years. Um, and I appreciate that we're getting to this point now, which is pretty significant where we're actually going to approve this document. As I was starting to say, um, I am not happy with the direction the Coastal Commission is trying to take about our town. I believe that we did, I believe that Katie has done what she believes is the most she could probably push the Coastal Commission, and we're optimistic that we come back, that they will accept some of the suggestions we've made. But the fact is, they may come back with more red lines, which is going to challenge this council, because I'll be gone, but my last night at Gapel, uh, to review those. And, and, and those will have significant effects on the city of Capitola. Uh, some may think it's for items like the hotel. I'm worried about more items like where the Coastal Commission has taken away homeowners' rights. And I'm really upset with the fact that the Coastal Commission is allowing us no option to protect our blood. And I'm extremely disappointed that in my eight years on this council, I did nothing to further the efforts to retain the blood. Uh, the best we ever did was we passed Measure F, which was a fund that was supposedly created to somewhat assist uh, the, the surge of the ocean against our, our, our fair little city. I, I took out of Katie's 813-page uh, uh, package that was submitted to us. There was a lot of uh, history in there and a lot of good reading. I just want to read the one paragraph here that just struck me because it, it, it feels like it's not only my failure, but the failure of the all city councils on Capitola. I just want to read this one paragraph. It says, probability of future occurrences based on its coastal location, the bluff and shoreline erosion will continue to occur in Capitola in our future. The amount of erosion will be dependent on the intensity of future storms and whether or not Corrective actions are taken by the city or county to protect the shoreline by reducing erosion rates. With regard to beach erosion, bluff failures, it is not a matter of whether the hazard will occur, it's more a matter of the rate at which that hazard will occur. This is inevitable that we will begin someday losing homes into the ocean. We've already lost Grand Avenue. We're now in the process of losing our trail, which I thought was priceless to the city. So I just want to say that when we send this document, there are some great things in here. We've changed the overlay zone. We've done some improvements to the village. There are things that are good for members of our community, and it's been a collective effort. And should we ever have a hotel, which I believe is doubtful, I, as uh, Council Member Story said, there are some tools in there that a future council will be able to make some good decisions about. So I'm glad that we've uh, made the motion and, uh, and have a second. We're going to be voting on this. I just hope that when it comes back to you, that you dig in and you take a stand and realize that the, the Coastal Commission is totally unreasonable. We don't have to accept it. And maybe the existing code we have is better than being taken control of. But I do want to commend the hard work of so many people uh, to get this document here. And I hope that we have a successful passage. Thank you, Councilman Bachner. All right, if there's no additional comments from Council, I believe we have a motion and a second on the floor. I'll turn it over uh, to the city clerk for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Bottorp. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. And we're going to move on now to the last item of the evening, item 8B, adopt a resolution approving the 2020 update to the City of Capitola Local Hazard Mitigation Plan. I'll turn it over to staff. Good evening, Mayor Council. Uh, thank you for uh, hearing this item tonight. The item before you tonight is a approval of an update to our local housing mitigation plan. Uh, just to give you a quick background on them, the local housing mitigation plan is a program that is developed to identify hazards that exist in the city 
um, that are likely to impact critical infrastructure. So it identifies the hazards first, and then it goes through and identifies critical critical infrastructure, utilities, uh, streets that are or may be impacted by the natural or uh, hazards, and then it um, identifies the mitigation efforts and planning to try and mitigate the uh, hazards as we move forward. Um, the first local housing mitigation plan for capital was adopted in 2013. That was a rather lengthy process we went through at that time, uh, engaging uh, quite a few stakeholders and utility companies and other jurisdictions. Uh, the, this is a document that lives with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and <clears throat> they require that it be updated every five years. Uh, we started the update for the 2013 and 2018, unfortunately it's taken us a little bit longer than we anticipated to get to this point, but we are ready today to adopt uh, the update to the mitigation plan. Uh, one last comment is that uh, the copy of the mitigation plan that was included in the agenda packet did not include appendix A. I apologize for that. When we were emailed that today, um, that did kind of a snapshot of history of uh, events in the city that have uh, caused uh, hazards and uh, damage. So it's, it's kind of an interesting read. At this point, I'd like to um, turn the item over to Bill Weissman with Kinley Horn and Associates. Kinley Horn adopt, wrote our first uh, 2013 LHNP and Bill has been key in providing this update. So Bill has been promoted. I would, uh, Bill, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Just confirm everyone can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Let me share my screen here. Can anyone see the uh, screen? All good. Okay. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, Mayor Peterson and Council members, appreciate the opportunity to give you a quick overview presentation of the local housing mitigation plan update. Uh, we were involved in the first update uh, that Steve mentioned, and so this is a, a carry on from that. Okay, so uh, to, uh, every five years, FEMA you know, requires an update, and there are major components of the update that we did in this um, revision was related to four criteria or four issues. So climate change, which we're going to talk quite a bit about, uh, updating the critical facilities list and the replacement costs associated with those, uh, or integrating the city zoning on update that uh, Katie has been working on so hard, and I have applaud her for that effort. That is a monumental effort as member of the Kudos uh, for her efforts on that. And then the uh, mitigation action. Um, let's see, I did have, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, let me, um, my VPN is gonna go out here. So just in case I have to get something from my server, it's just notified me. So let me deal with that, I apologize.
So it's made up of city staff from different departments and then external. And these external um, are really stakeholders that deal with uh, facilities, roads, and uh, you know, emergency related activities, uh, utility providers like pg and &E Soquel. The school district is, is on there because they provide emergency shelters. And then there's uh, policy organizations such as the National Weather Service and the U.S. Geological Survey. So we coordinated with them, with them as part of this update. So what schema requires is that you uh, identify the various categories, which are called hazard profiles. And there's 11 categories, and you can see those listed on the left side of the screen. And then there's a ranking process that we go through that looks at what the potential impacts are. So it looks at the probability of those impacts and then affected areas, primary and secondary impacts to come up with a scoring. And then that scoring is converted to either limited, moderate, or significant. And I think the main takeaway from this slide is those that are shown in yellow, there's three categories that are identified as a significant potential hazard. And those are earthquake and associated liquefaction, uh, flooding, and includes both river and, and coastal. It's important to understand there's a relationship between the two, particularly with respect to Snowcat Creek and its tributaries. And then sea level rise, which is really a climate change consideration, and that is uh, uh, interconnected, if you will, with uh, flood-related issues. So the city has, or the, the LHMP identifies 22 facilities that are considered critical facilities within the uh, city limits. And those include uh, city and other agency facilities such as city hall, police station, fire station, and then critical infrastructure such as the seawall, uh, bridges, pump and pump station. So those are listed here. I know they're a little small, but they're identified in the LHMP as far as the listing of those are. With that ranking that we looked at earlier, and we look at those facilities, uh, we look at what facilities are most at risk and what those categories are, uh, the hazard risk um, categories. So as you can see here, the facilities that are, and this is just sort of the top um, items, is Stockton Bridge, and particularly because it's one of only uh, three ways out of the village, and it's a very important road, and then when flooding happens, you know, there's potential to, to damage bridge, the pump station that's down at the park, and then you can see the rest of these Hunt Drive, Maple Gulch, etc. So I'm going to focus in on the flood hazards and its relationship to sea level rise. So this map is showing you the critical facilities that's on that list from the previous graphic. And then the areas in different shades of blue are showing what the flood hazards are. So there's the kind of lighter blue, which is a 100 year flood zone. And then there's the 500, there's a, a 100 year flood zone with coastal flooding, and that's the purple that you see you know, along the coastline there. And then there's the 500 year flood zone, which is this darker area, for example, up where the Knob Hill shopping center is. So there's an interrelationship between flooding and sea level rise that I talked about earlier. And one of the things that the LHMP and the Coastal Commission requires is that we use the latest information and research. So sea level rise is an ongoing um, you know, analysis nationwide as well as what's going on along the coast. And so in the previous LHMP, we looked at the National Resource Council, so that's the second column. And this is an estimate of median high risk diversions in feet. So it's showing the year time horizons and the best estimates based on data that's available. And for this LHMP update, we used a more current uh, number, which is, or numbers, which is came from the Ocean Protection Council. So this is from 2018. And then the delta of that is showing that basically the sea level rise analysis and research is indicating that there's an increase of potential, so the sea level rise numbers have increased, and you can see based on the different years, and by 20 or 2100, uh, the delta is 1.7 feet. So we're dealing with basically, uh, as research gets better, the story gets worse, is really the, the takeaway from this one. So 
So using that data um, with those those not number estimates, we did an overlay or I should say um, uh, the subsequent study which I'll talk about shortly that did the overlay of, of data that looks at um, projections out in the years for 2030, 2060, and 2100. So those are the different shades of blue, and you can see those on the map overlaid with where the critical facilities are. So for example, uh, these areas that are within numbers one, two, which is uh, City Hall, um, the wharf areas around the um, in the village, for example, the jetty and the seawall, etc. Those are areas that would be prone to um, effects from sea level rise and coastal flooding. So um, I mentioned a report. So one of the key reports that's new that was incorporated into the LIJP is a report that was prepared by the Central Coast Wetlands Group. And they came up with a number of, of issues that they identified in the report. And I'm just going to summarize these here. And I'm sorry, we have a fair amount of text in the next few slides because there's a lot of information that relates to what the recommendations are and then what the mitigations are. But I think they're important to understand in the context of uh, the significant changes that were updated in this plan. So the, the report identifies issues associated with infrastructure that's closest to the beach that can be affected from the waves, uh, sand deposition, uh, kelp and other matters, and uh, it, that will be caused by flood waters that don't drain between the waves. In other words, for example, there's a big storm surge and there's water coming down from Sunfall Creek, and then it interacts with uh, sea level rise. You basically get a, a higher inundation because that water doesn't have anywhere to go. There's also uh, impacts of infrastructure further inland that would be caused by both flooding and uh, ocean sea level rise. And what the report identified is that property values by 2060 could increase or could be uh, damage could be impacting about $275 million uh, worth of damage. And it would also cause uh, issues of access to the um, Capitola Beach. And by 2060, it would could potentially affect the river walkway, which is estimated that uh, flood waters could, could be estimated up to eight feet. So it's, it's along the coast and inland up the, the river, or up the creek, excuse me, um, that could be affected. Uh, by 2010, it doesn't get much better. Um, much of the beach area, the, the back beach structures, for example, the sea level rise, if they're rebuilt in their current location, could still uh, be affected by higher level sea rise. It would affect a number of properties within that area, uh, both within the bluff erosion zone as well as from sea level rise itself. And there will be periodic flooding both um, during winter storms and then even potentially monthly as it's related to uh, sea level rise. I think it's important just to have some context. You know, it's not just, um, you know, th this is a, a analysis that's based on modeling, and there's a range of scenarios that allows for interpretation, so it's more of an art than a science that looks at this. Um, but that's not to say that it's taken lightly, it's just that there's, there's variations in the research and it's evolving as we, you know, deal with climate change as a broader issue that we decide to go with today. Um, the LHMP includes those reports that were recommended, the strategies, and that's what I'm going to get to uh, in a couple slides. And one of the major conclusions is to continue working with the Coastal Commission and other stakeholders in developing what's called adaptation strategies. And I just want to highlight what those are and how that works within a planning process. So um, with any type of sea level rise studies, there's a, basically a cycle, and that's what you're seeing on the left side with this circular diagram. And that the first three is basically review the science, look, identify what those vulnerabilities are, and assess the risks. And that's really what this LHMP has done. It's done those first three components. The next stage is to develop an adaptation plan. The city doesn't have that as yet. But that, the, the, the categories of adaptation typically deal with three categories. The first one is is protection, and there's a subset of that is basically two types of protection modes. One is 
hard protection uh, strategies such as sea walls, revetments, and bulkheads. And then the other is soft uh, protection such as natural based solutions that might deal with uh, levees or dune restoration. In this case, you don't really have those available to you uh, given the relationship of the coast uh, with, the, with the ocean and sea in the bay. The second strategy is to accommodate, and that could be by elevating structures, retrofitting or strengthening. Uh, or changing designations and zoning. So you're trying to basically address the infrastructure directly um, with some sort of modification. And the last one is uh, manage relocation and retreat, and that's where you look at either demolition or relocation outside of the, uh, of the sea level you know, inundation zone. And I think it's important with this to understand that typically these should only happen in areas where you know, costs are effective and there's some long-term benefits because obviously it has significant environment or, uh, economic impact as well as environmental impact. So we have to be looked at carefully in that context. So the, I mentioned before that uh, the report identified a number of mitigation actions and that's what I'm going to go through here in the next uh, four slides. So these uh, came out of the, the wetlands report and I think it's important to understand these are the most significant mitigation actions that uh, we updated in, in the plan making this slide. Uh, the first one, item P, is to improve resiliency of flooding along Soho Creek and the coast. And this could be reconstruction of flood walls, improving improved building guidelines, uh, such as uh, increasing freeboard and, for example, first level floor parking. So these are modifications that could occur to help reduce flooding at Pesca. The second is to investigate natural habitat buffering um, to reduce coastal flooding, and this could be, for example, sand replenishment and pet management along the coast. Uh, R deals with upgrading vulnerable storm drains along SoCal Creek, and S is addressing uh, opportunities for uh, beach replenishment and nourishment in concert with rebuilding the city's groin or the jetty, which Steve talked about uh, at the beginning of the um, meeting this evening. Item T talks to or addresses coastal bluff and beach management. Uh, and this looks at both long and short-term strategies that can help for long-term protection and adaption. Item U is to prioritize coastal protection structures to upgrade and replacement, for example, the seawall. And then lastly is resiliency improvements, uh, particularly as they relate to critical vehicular and non-vehicular uh, coastal access roads, for example, uh, Stockton Bridge. Item W talks about policy center municipal capital improvements. So this would address issues or strategies that should be considered with respect to, for example, the city hall and the fire station. Uh, looking at temporary or permanent flood wall along Snowfell Creek uh, walking path, which identified earlier, this could increase during a flooding event of up to 80 feet. Uh, item Y is to identify priority areas for future protection, so that ties in with uh, the identification of those critical facilities. And then item Z we added in context to um, a letter that we received from the um, Surf Rider Foundation. And this is to look at uh, long-term options to manage sea level rise um, as it relates to more of those soft uh, techniques that I mentioned, such as moving shorelines, soft honoring, uh, relocation, et cetera. And also, they also made a recommendation about looking at long-term protective measures along Depot Hill due to uh, beach erosion related issues. So that's a summary. So just so you understand in context for where we're going to go forward, uh, assuming uh, Ms. Ops, the LHMP tonight. First off, if there's any comments, they should be sent to the address that's shown on the screen. So if the public has any comments to add, um, certainly welcome. It's um, not too late to yet. Uh, then the resolution gets sent back in its final form to FEMA. And from there, um, the city will be looking for grant applications to implement these mitigation strategies. And long term is over the next five years is to plan ahead for the update for 2025. That's 
Steve mentioned the Appendix A, which we received today. Sorry that that wasn't included. But we thought it might be good to just end with a little historic context and look back, because while these sort of hazards, you know, you may be not thinking of them day to day, but they're certainly episodic, and then when they do happen, they can be truly catastrophic. So to go back another time and go forward, this is a photo from 1890. And at that time, there was a wagon bridge in addition to a former stocking bridge that went across Soquel Creek. And there was a huge flood that occurred at that time and it washed off portions of the wagon bridge. In 1911, there was a significant erosion that happened along um, uh, Grand Avenue where the cliff just basically came out. And this is a good example of episodic. So there's a, there's a rate of, of um, erosion that happens along the coast, but it doesn't necessarily all happen you know, year to year. It's, a, it's more of an episodic event where all of a sudden Chunks of the, the, the uh, sandstone give way and come off of the cliff. Uh, so I, I thought it was interesting in the, the uh, appendix A, it talks about one of the ways that they tried to mitigate that erosion in 1911. So the owner of uh, El Salto uh, Resort, his name was, uh, let's see, let's get my notes here, uh, Mr. Hanschick, he decided that maybe if he uh, chopped the trees down, along the cliff that it might to reduce the rate of erosion. So this is a woman on her cell phone calling Steve to tell her that uh, she's not quite sure that that's the right approach to take. <laughs> in uh, 1926, there were some uh, very high tides that occurred. It caused considerable damage to the, um, to the Capitola Village. Uh, there were waves that affected the second story of the um, hotel. That, existed down there, then it was also uh, uh, impacts on Venetian courts and flooding went um, well into the, throughout the village, as you can see my yellow lap is with Jim and Ms. Canoodle. Uh, and I'm not sure when you see the last time you saw someone canoeing through the Capitol Village. In 1955 was the highest floods that occurred and uh, well there wasn't, um, it didn't directly impact um, the city as a whole, there was impacts down in, in the village in SoCal that exceeded a million dollars happened that, that day. Uh, most significantly, there was a house and five cabins, and you can see that in the lower right, along with debris that came down SoCal Creek. And it was so extensive that it actually destroyed the uh, SoCal Dry Bridge that's just upstream. So they completely destroyed it. So that's why the issue of stocking bridge is important, because an event like this could cause significant damage to the bridges and other infrastructure along Soquel Creek. Um, I think Steve and I were talking this morning. It's uh, what, 30, 31 years? I can't do the math. It's, yeah, 31 years since the Loma Prieta earthquake. And um, it caused extensive damage, particularly regionally. This is a photo down on um, the Pacific Ave Mall with the Cooper House behind it. Well, the rest of it is a beautiful building. I'm sorry that we lost it. But, um, there wasn't a significant damage to Capitola itself, um, and luckily no one was hurt within Capitola. And then more recently, in 2011, there was a flood that occurred that was primarily related to, um, in Noble uh, Gulch, the underwater drainage way that gave way and it burst within the Pacific Cove uh, mobile home park, and as a result, that caused significant flooding um, throughout the, the village and even city hall. So there's a picture on the left of, of the city hall parking lot and on the right is uh, the water coming out of the street and hitting the road there and uh, going down off the, the ocean. So that's an overview with a little bit of history and uh, Steve and I are open to questions and comments and I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, are there any members of the council that have any questions? I see council member Story, and then we'll go to council member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, thank you for that sobering presentation. Um, it's, it's both one fascinating and um, and kind of scary at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, there were several questions that came up for me and. Um, 
maybe he, if I can just maybe throw them out there, then um, um, I'll, I'll take it. Um, I missed the responses uh, offline. Um, but number one, at the ending there, that appendix, that is, that is a fascinating history, pictorial history of Capitola's struggles with mostly water. Um, and I was wondering if we could uh, post that on our website um, as kind of a standalone uh, item, uh, maybe with a more um, um, attention-grabbing title um, so that people can get a sense of what um, the histories of disasters in Capitola uh, have looked like because, you know, I think that the past is kind of prologue of the things that we may need to prepare for. And so that, uh, that was kind of a request and uh, as well as that's possible to do. Um, and the other, I wanted to, um, it was mentioned that Capitola, we don't, through that, in that cycle of the process of, you know, a review and assessment and then having an adaptation plan, which it was mentioned that we do not have one. I was wondering, uh, number one, the question is, what's the relationship between the adaptation plan and the mitigation plan, uh, which we do have? Um, um, and whether, I mean, if, um, whether we should be thinking about preparing an adaptation plan. Um, and then within that context of the mitigation uh, uh, plan action, I noticed that, you know, there's several items that have target deadlines that are coming up. Um, for example, item R, which is the storm drain, um, which has a target date of 2030. Um, and the black block management um, had a, a target date coming up within, I think, also 2030. Um, and, um, and, and I was wondering if we have underlying more detailed action steps uh, to uh, meet those particular deadlines. And that was my question on that. Um, and then my last question um, is concerning the mitigation action S, which is referring to the, the beach um, um, nourishment or alternatives. And that has a 2020 deadline, and that's connected to the rebuilding of the jetty. And, and I was wondering, Steve, whether the rebuilding of the jetty is it going to incorporate um, some of the beach nourishment, renourishment uh, procedures or processes? Um, because I, I was also, um, I, I guess, drawing attention to the surf riders' letter and their comments about that those kinds of hard protections are particularly in the jetty could be contributing to the uh, block erosion on Beefell Hill. Um, so, yeah, I know I threw a lot out there, but those are my questions. And if you want me to repeat any of them, uh, yeah, let me know. But otherwise, I'll shut up for now. Hi, Captain Story. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of work back with them as I go through these. Um, first, the first beach nourishment. So, the, the idea behind the jetty uh, restoration is, is to capture more sand um, and provide that nourishment on, on a seasonal basis. As we know, um, so our beach is essentially washed out every winter or during the normal winter. Um, so doing beach nourishment, like they do in Southern California, where they tuck in 100 yards of, of sand, if we were to do that at any point, we most likely lose that sand the next the following winter. So we don't have a beach nourishment from a, a typical standpoint, but we do have, that's why we're trying to beef up the structures that help capture the sand. Regarding the beach nourishment and the uh, jetty and the impact on Grand Avenue, um, you know, we, when the coastal or the uh, Surfrider Foundation first approached us about uh, looking at options for that, we, we went back and looked at, and there's never been a large buildup of sand along the Eagle Hill Beach area. Um, if that jetty isn't there, basically what the coastline from uh, Capitola looks like is what it looks like now uh, below Grand Avenue. 
There is no way to sustain, continue to move. It doesn't capture itself uh, along our section of coast here. So we would essentially, we learned that um, before the jetty was built after the yacht harbor was built, there was very little uh, beach in the entire area. So the idea that um, we are taking sand that would protect uh, Grand Avenue at this point, um, there isn't a lot of evidence supporting it at this point. We do know that the sand mitigates, the sand travels around um, the jetty. So we're, you know, it fills up to a certain point and then the sand continues to, to move south and it does build up uh, south of the, or east of the jetty at this point. So um, when we talk about beach, beach nourishment, I think we're talking about on a seasonal basis and having the structures in place. Uh, regarding the action plans and the next steps, so a big part of this is um, approval of the LHMP provides us the opportunity to receive grants. Um, I think that's our next step is to find grants to complete these um, future studies that need to happen by 2030 and additional steps. Um, it, it, in, in total, they're probably to be quite expensive for the, the city at the front of us. We are going to be taking additional funding to help us complete you know, these, these studies that will identify what is the best steps for us to go forward. And then in relation to the, um, you know, the, where we're going to move forward and the, and the uh, retreat or we do a planned retreat or the, the adaptation plan, that's the word. Um, I know the community development director, Katie, is working with the Coastal Commission to develop a, uh, a framework for an adaptation plan that's both accessible to the city and to the Coastal Commission. So that's something that is going to be actively worked on. And then finally, I'm trying to say, so that was put together by our previous museum director, John Swift, um, and back in 2013. I think it'd be great. I, I will work with our current museum director, Frank, to see if we can, you know, add some narrative to it a little bit more. It's a little dry right now, some pictures and, and sort of comments. And I think that'd be a, a great thing to get on our website. So we'll work on that. Thank you for that response. I appreciate it. And yeah, I look forward to some, uh, looking at some of these other um, you know, mitigation efforts uh, and the, uh, dealing with the adaptation elements uh, coming in the future. Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understand the mitigation plan. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, maybe it's not something that can be answered right now, but in the back of my mind is, you know, what we have plans, whether it's the mitigation or the adaptation, depending on the circumstance. Um, the idea of um, the necessity of how to pay for it comes up. You know, I think we could get money for the grant. And as Ed talked about earlier, you know, we, we have uh, the issue with the bluff. And so who pays for what work can be done there to protect people's homes and stuff. And then, as you said, Steve, you know, the Coast on this piece of block has always been the short bit of sand. I know Jenny didn't really change it that much. So I, I don't know if um, Steve or, or Bill you could offer something there. I don't think there's any definite answer, but I'd sort of like to know maybe if you can answer this the general direction of communities. Um, we're a poor, relatively poor community. I'm sure our approach would be a lot different than San Diego. I mean, San Francisco is redoing its fall as bull. And they work. <laughs> They're honoring that whole thing, closing and involving. So they, they have old and what is it? Uh, Fox and City just passed something. They're, they're redoing the same thing, basically. So just some thoughts if, if possible, because I don't know what's been done out there, but we can't expect that. You know, I don't, um, I think the Coastal case is very unique. Um, I, I think we can look at those thoughts, what's going on. You know, the adaptation plan. Um, there's a lot of work going in on that, so I think that's based on what other people are doing. As far as, you know, what our options are, uh, as far as for protecting uh, the people that help up, um, I think that's going to take some study. I think we know what the options are. There's, you know, more jetty for growing is the appropriate term. Uh, sand, you know, soft farmering, or uh, potentially even, you know, reefs on the outer, outer edges of that. 
upon the water. I mean, those are the, the, there may be others, and I think those are the studies we need to initiate and try to get some grant funding to initiate and, and complete those now. All of those, whatever we do there, is going to take quite a bit of time to uh, design or identify a design permit to construct. So, I mean, we're, we're, just, we're talking, you know, easily a, a decade before we can get something built there, I believe. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Botworth. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, with that, we can. Did we have a question? Was there a comment? Sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, with that, we come to the end of tonight's uh, meeting. Thank you all for your time this evening. Uh, thank you to our uh, presenters and staff for all the work they've done on tonight's agenda item. Uh, with that, we will call the meeting to a close, call the meeting adjourned. Uh, thank you so much. Please take care of yourself and take care of each other. Have a good night. Thank you. Goodbye.